Right, I'm just going to introduce. Okay. Do we, are we just recording the sound? No. Oh. Are you happy with the video? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Adam Miller did the whole thing nice and I understand that she and that you're okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, guys, are you all ready? Lovely to see you all. Uh, welcome to the first. Uh, Center for Poetry and Poetics 2022 Autumn Reading Series. And we are really happy to uh, be able to welcome two um, writers, two authors for tonight, uh, Rachel Gen and Emma Bolland. I'm afraid if you were expecting Mendoza to, to, to read for us today, uh, they 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 are un unable to. They were unable to make it be, uh, due to illness. So our apologies about that. It was a last minute uh, sickness. Um, so uh, really lovely to 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 continue the, the 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 series this year, this academic year with the hybrid reading. It's a bit uh, of a um, of a complicated thing to to be running the, the readings, uh, both online and, and in person. But uh, so apologies if, if, if there, there is anything uh, that's gonna go wrong, particularly on the online uh, side of things. Um, so the way we are gonna do this is just the usual setup. Uh, we'll have uh, Rachel to read for us first after my uh, short introduction, uh, followed by Emma without a break. And if the writers are up for it, we are going to have a little chat after that. We've started having little conversations post reading, and I think it works really nicely. Uh, so already put your thinking hat on if you've got any questions, either online or uh, people in the room here. Um, so the introductions short introductions to the writers tonight uh, uh, goes like this rachel gan is a senior lecturer at manchester writing school at university and the university of sheffield until now formerly a neuroscientist she was a royal society fellow at ubc canada and has written two novels the cure <laughs> Uh, which came out in 2011, and what could you have won? Uh, 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 another uh, fiction text which came out in 2020. She was a uh, liver Hume artist in residence in 2016, creating a quasi institution called the National Facility for the Regulation of Regret. This is going to be one of my questions, so don't ask about that because I want to ask about that. Spanning installation and interactive art, uh, VR and film, presented together at uh, South by Southwest in 2017. Um, Rachel has a, a non-fiction non publication in Granta, Los Angeles Review of Books, E.ON and the New St uh, Statesman, and is currently working on a collection on non-fiction about her family's injuries, fighting, and addiction to regret. After Rachel, we are gonna, uh, and, and this is an opportunity, I'm afraid, uh, an informal opportunity for us to, uh, uh, on behalf of the School of English and the University of Sheffield to say a huge thank you to Rachel who actually taught uh, on the MA uh, program in creative writing for more than a term, two terms if we can, the, the summer term as well. So thank you so much for the beautiful work you've done. Um, the second uh, author we warmly welcome tonight is Emma Bolland. Re-welcome, really. And anyway, Emily, uh, Emma has never gone, uh, so it's not a return. You were perpetually around and here, uh, <laughs> living in Sheffield. That was a bit strange introduction, but I, I am getting there eventually. So Emma Bulland, uh, uh, 
is an artist and writer employing experimental approaches to intergenre, uh, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary writing, speaking, and reading. This includes an investigation of the problematics and ambiguities of an expanded understanding of translation between languages and language codes and between voice, ear, and page. Other methods include works on paper, moving image, performance, collaborations and events, and they have paintings and other works in public uh, collections. They're interested in the wider politics of communication and the conflicts between medical and social models of disability. They co-edit Intergraphia books, that's also one of my questions, an experimental press with uh, forthcoming titles by Anthony Ivani Capildeo, Sasha Achta, Mark Goodwin, Jan Hopkins, and many more. Um, they teach fine art at Sheffield Hallam and also Bolton University, and are a tutor for the Poetry School. Recent artworks uh, include a commission for the exhibition Imperfect at the Mervo or Mevo Kunsthalle Memmingham in Germany in 2021, and recent publications include their collection Over, In and Under. It's a Dostoevsky uh, wannabe collection which came out in 2019. Their hybrid long poem novella instructions from Light will be published by Joan Publishing later this year. So, uh, yet another warm welcome to both of you, Rachel and Emma. Thank you. Um, I've brought this book along, but I, I don't think I will be reading from it. Uh, but if you're interested in knowing how a, a relationship between a psychiatrist and a singer, um, when the psychiatrist treats the singer as a drug experiment, turns out fire. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, what I uh, what I plan to do tonight is um, read you some sections. Uh, I call, shards is what I want to say about this work. Uh, uh, something whole that's smashed, probably. Although. Um, I don't know what the whole is. Uh, I'm reading parts of a, an essay that is published. It's, a, it's an entire essay, but it's published in two parts. One half is in Firmament, which is this gorgeous little journal that comes out of, I think, Seattle from sublunary editions in America. And Tolka, which is a, a fantastic little journal that is funded by the Arts Council in Ireland and makes beautiful products. Uh, the entire essay is called Rita After Lorca, and in between shards, I will explain some of the motivations behind uh, writing this essay. But I will start by echoing, and using the word echoing, not lightly, a talk that I heard last night between Daniela Cashella and Jennifer Hodgson where they were to, Daniela does a lot of, of work around silence and how that affects form and she was talking last night about the nothing as we need it which is one of her books and what prompted me what prompted me to start thinking about how I could write about my relationship with my mother was the 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 nothingness that she often left and the nothingness that I felt between us that's not to say that I didn't have a great love for her and her for me, perhaps. But what I wanted to talk about was the, uh, how uncertainty can be a ballast for us, something that can keep us in there looking, listening for what it was about us that is worth reporting. Um, and incidentally, I went to look for a grave yesterday for the second time and couldn't find it. But make of that what you will. I'm really interested in how sonar works and how sound uh, can end up leaving you with a visual image. So uh, the idea of x-rays and cyanotypes, sonar, those kind of things are always in the back of my mind when I'm thinking about how to clothe the nothing 
that is there often when we go back to remember. Um, what I also struggle with in remembering and reporting is the idea, or not the idea, but the, the, the task of uh, bringing up what I didn't know then, uh, what I can never know since she's dead, and the reverb, the kind of like weft to that warp um, of my truth versus the truth. So uh, a lot of vibrations going on at the same time when I am looking back at this relationship. And I'm going to start with um, the idea of her not being there. And this is not metaphorically speaking. It's her not being there because she worked so much that she was barely ever there. On her bedroom floor, I'd lay out, limbs haphazard in these desolate, awkward arrangements in the hope of catching something as it happened, something I'd been missing. Knowing that something of her was in that emptiness meant pushing against the idea of being wrong and doing wrong and going wrong. I was making early connections between madness and love. You can spend your life in a gulf knowing it's not empty but finding nothing. You told yourself it was worth the hours of staying still because you never knew. Some love she'd imprinted into the walls might give up its camouflage or get sick hiding. Once it saw how long I could wait, it would have no choice. Look how good I can be. Love might give itself away with a sound or a movement, no longer able to contain itself, finally letting you in on what it thought you had known all along. See? A diamond in the pattern of the wallpaper might push itself out, walk off flush to the wall. It was the same in the shop with my father right there sharpening his knives, and me with my face in the sawdust, clearing patches of floor with breath out of my nostrils. I became a simple beast, not looking for anything, letting whatever was coming land on me. Forging a special relationship with what was happening, I could search for them even when they were there. So one of the reasons that my mother was never there was that she had to work so many jobs she had to work so many jobs because she couldn't read and write. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how I have reimagined how that might have felt and what that means in a wider sense. Her name is Rita, by the way. I don't know if I've mentioned that. When Rita wrote back to my father's letters from his national service in Khartoum, he would take those notes to the toilet to decipher them, to hide them, really, because she'd made marks in pencil, but there were no letters, no words. He was learning that without a written language, a poor woman can still make an indelible impression. Anne Boyer said there are entire genres of women writing that do not yet have names. As far as we can find literate women, we can find these nameless genres. Probably they existed for women pre-literacy too. The duende is a force, not a labour, a struggle, not a thought. Rita's ways of inviting the world in to meet me are what I am made of. That is to say, boundless ways of being something massive, and she made her will known by unconventional methods. Exerting herself in the gaps between meanings, she influenced those around her by appealing beyond their senses, revealing herself in benign mists and pressurised gases, which seemed natural to us, her being too potent to be contained by language. She gave us odd whiffs of the ineffable contingency of our inheritance. When she was about 40 odd, she decided that if she couldn't read and write, she was going to narrate her story by traveling. And she learned to drive, and then she drove to Africa immediately. Uh, and then she got stuck on her way back in Andalusia and forever after that she would return to that area. That, she didn't really care where she was in it and she took us to some of the weirdest, most 
odd places. Uh, she used to take us back to a hotel every year that were horrible to us and where there were no other guests. And it was absolutely in the middle of like the Mesa. There was nothing, nothing apart from this hotel and us and the awful, terrible, frightening staff and some other incidents which you can read about in here, but I'm not going to go into. Um, and it was when I read uh, Lorca's theory and play of Duende and realised that he got over what he wanted to about the, the, the passion and the darkness behind that creative spirit that he talks about in that lecture by talking about what it isn't most of the time. And so it was something in the shape of that and the way of not discovering and, 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 and uh, rendering by absence that fitted with my mother and chuck Andalusia into the mix and I was all in. You know, I just wanted to write about what drew me to that centre of uh, what the overlaps were between those things. I wanted to know more about it. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, the road into the hotel we always used to go to. With nothing on the road, we approached the province of Toledo by the same route every time. Our arrival at the hotel seemed always to be in the key, keening heat of early evening, but was offset by a mismatched light, an unnerving shadow that made us feel it was later on. In the tablelands of mid-Spain, the hotel was chosen from a map as a relay stop by my father. Ocaña sat on the handwritten list somewhere between Burgos and Jaén. The grey road in was stripped to white in the, heat of the inlands. Sing, uh, sorry, stripped to white in that heat of the inlands that sings around valleys scorched to the colour of a lion's mane. Surrounded, you would think, by nothing living. An ugly square hotel without fence or adornment. No signs of the butter and lightning yellows in the paintings of El Greco. If I'm looking for consolation here, Lorca assures me I'm in the wrong place, pointing out that it's no accident that all Spanish art is rooted in our soil full of thistles and sharp stones. Lucky then that Rita was an oyster, an animal in sisterhood with rock, who dug herself into the baked land, ready to cut the foot off any trespasser who claimed her new home. Speaking no Spanish and little English, she owned that hotel on first entry, walking into the lobby as if ready to conduct an exorcism. In Rita, shame and exhibitionism had perfectly cancelled each other out, as behoves a desert oyster. She was there to share things only the land knew, for instance, that a person was not the source of their language. Like a flame devours paper, so my mother narrated herself and as Denise Riley puts it, a pure speaking out. Uh, the more I read about um, Duende and uh, the, the blackness and the, the relationship with death that inspiration must have for Lorca to count it as Duende, uh, the more I realized that this was really my mother's uh, ballpark. Um, <clears throat> the bull has its own orbit, this is Lorcan, the Toreador his, and between orbit and orbit lies the point of danger, where the vertex of terrible play exists. I think it brought bad luck when my brothers set fire to the wedding album after gouging out everyone's eyes with razor blades, but who really knows? Occasionally, Rita would bite us to prove something, but I never got down to what. My brother is the spitting image of Maradona, and this makes me feel I've won at something. I know he's not Mexican, but he nearly is. And Lorca said Mexico's was the only hand that could hold Spain's when it came to death, and warned that the duende won't appear if he can't see the possibility of death, if he doesn't know that he can haunt death's house, if he's not certain to shake those branches we all carry that do not bring, can never bring, consolation. Had consolation loomed, 
Rita would have chopped it up like an angel with two swords. And I feel here I have to point out her resemblance to the footballer, Ronaldo. And not just the conceit and ostentation, but also the cheekbones and the hairline. That skin tone, a small chin that makes people think they can deal with her easily. I need you to know how gorgeous they were. She was. How vital, essential, beautiful. You need to know about how good looking they all were. My brothers sitting behind each other on the stairs, having their hair tongued and blow dried by girls. Only one plug socket. My mother's spunk, her courage, and how important that was to those who heard of it. And how all this was because of, not despite being illiterate. The impediment was the way. How important. How on earth can I get this across? Um, I now want to read. A little bit more from this one. Um, so this is us driving home. This is something that actually happened where honesty and truth meet. Uh, we had made it just outside Andalusia before we broke down, something whacking and flapping horribly in the engine. And I was shocked because I had a sexy book inside a boring one. And I thought I'd been caught by Spanish God. We left the car at the side of the road and walked through a steamy pine wood. Spain, the hut, the wheel of a cart, the razor, the rubble, eventually reaching a single story group home with little chimneys and shutters, the wounding li limes of eaves and balconies. We knocked, it was a convalescent home and they let us telephone through to Granada to request a mechanic. We were shuffled into a room full of ancient hedgehog madres crying into handkerchiefs, the lace covered saints, the prickly beards of shepherds. Each bent at the TV and weeping as Charles was taking Diana as his princess. The damp cupboards, the rubble. Our terrible car needed its own special fan belt. And we stayed the night with Las Abuelas, the barren moon, the flies. Um, I'm now going to read I'll finish on this I think have I got enough time to read yeah. um, being easily tanned and undaunted by illiteracy were these things to be renowned for See, my mother was so ambitious and wanted to be renowned for something, but I don't think she knew what. Did this count as success? It was impossible for anyone to tell from her actions that my mother wanted to be liked. She never flirted with anyone that I saw, especially not my father. And though she didn't need others to tell her that she was a success, she stalked in impatient circles. This is Lorca now. Lorca comes through this quite a lot. Her moribund duende sweeping the earth with its wings made of rusty knives, waiting for us to catch up. She found Lorca Spain in later life, in the hot air between the grasses and corn stalks. It was Spain that sprung a compulsion in her breast to squander her verve. Here she wanted to be noticed by the earth itself. 
The duende gives a woman's hair the odor of a midnight seaport. The complicity of the Spanish night brought her out like jasmine, and she was longing for longing without a language or any consolation that she could recognize. And so the duende, of course, rushed in to claim her. She performed her adventures for the envy of others because she had not yet made the impression that Duende demanded of her. But longing finds its own feet. In search of more, Rita criss crisscrossed the bull's hide that stretches across Andalusia from the rock of Cayenne to the snail shell of Cadiz. Where the Austin Allegro's heated rear window was smashed at the port and a rare present from my mother to me, a pigskin duffel bag was nicked. In this province, Lorca said, the people recognize Duende wherever it appears with a fine instinct. And Rita followed that instinct on a wind that smells of a child's saliva, crushed grass. And with the crafty logic of the lover, she extended her feelers to the boundary of this territory. A land of wanting, far from their warm bread and gentle grazing cattle, with its norms of sweeping sky and dry sierra, crying out for the flounce on the flamenco dress to droop with dread. While the duende has to be roused from the furthest habitations of the blood, it was in this deep southern enclave where Rita felt it easiest to summon. I'll just read one more small part. Okay, I'll read it. Kind of hurts with the grave. I hope it's not too morbid. When the doctor told Rita my father was dying, my father said he wanted to walk with her into the horizon so she wouldn't look at him and push his hand away. Rita knew what she valued was a conduit, not a destination, a flow, not a hoard. It took everything she had to make us understand that love was not about being held like a kite, but held like a gaze. There's no there was no containing to be had with her. But by knowing her as you did, you got to learn that longing lasts in waves, and you could wait. That wasn't nothing. And when the hospital called very early one morning in September, my brother fell to his knees. I think I'd had an E. We all drove there in another upsetting car, but my father was dead by the time we got there. Anyway, she got into bed with him and held both his hands under the covers. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Just a second, guys. Um, Emma will be reading in about two minutes. Thank <laughs> you. 
And it's not just me. best oh gosh very bright lights so i'm best about here okay um thank you so much to uh aggie and adam for inviting me to read at the center of poetics it's uh, a great privilege it's a, a long-standing and very well respected series so it does it means a lot actually um and thank you to rachel for i actually not gonna <laughs> just such exquisite work thank you Okay, I'm going to read from the manuscript for a book that um, should have been out now, but as any publisher uh, will tell you, there's publishing takes, uh, particularly this year, it's taken a very long time, there's global paper shortages, all kinds of things, so the book is, is not out yet. Um, it's a strange book, it's running through it is uh, a translation of a my translation of a uh, 1920 screenplay uh, written by Louis Deluc for his film uh, Les Silences. Um, so you know a, a, a thread I think for us. Um, and I'm really interested in uh, silence, um, both as a tool, both as uh, something that is enforced upon us, but both as something as a as a tool or as a, a weapon or as a strategy. Um, and the different nuances and modes of silence. Um, I'm not really going to tell you about the screenplay, uh, the story of that much, and I'm not going to read, I'll read bit, I'm actually not going to read many sections that have that, the uh, actual screenplay in, but when I do, I won't be reading French out loud because my uh, accent is terrible. And actually the premise of the book was when I started writing it, I, I came across, the screenplay, or I read about the screenplay, and I, I uh, and I thought I was reading about the film, and I said this sounds really interesting. And um, then they mentioned that the screenplay uh, was was in print, or you could get a copy. So I bought the screenplay, and it arrived, and it was in French. I am really terrible at languages. I also have kind of memory problems, so I can learn something, then I have to relearn. So it's this daily. Uh, effort with language, kind of language struggles. And that's sort of what really interests me about language as a practice, is that it's um, a kind of effort, and that we all we are almost translating ourselves as we have to kind of work both with the daily labour of language, but and, and with the practice of writing and performing. Uh, the screenplay arrived. It was in French, and then I found out that the film was actually lost. It had been lost, not you know, a decade or so after it had been made. Louis de Luc is uh, extremely well known in, in France. He's part of their kind of avant-garde canon, um, but not uh, not really well known in the Anglophone world. So the book, the book, uh, the spine of it, uh, its narrator is a, um, a bad translator who is struggling to translate this manuscript. And as they translate, uh, as, as time goes on and they struggle more and more, um, they begin to descend into a kind of madness and psychosis. So the book, uh, it, it, it's sort of on the page, it looks partly like a prose poem, partly like um, a screenplay, but also um, 
it's this kind of essayistic or kind of auto theoretical interjections. So, this is a book about, oh, and it's called Instructions from Light. That might help. This is a book about, this is a book about a sanity in flux. This is a book that will always be a speculative draft. This is a book about reading and speaking, not speaking, through the lens of the screenplay Le Silence, written by Louis de Luc for his 1920 Impressionist film of the same name. Published as Traduction Retour, three years after the film's production, the film survives as only a few damaged fragments, or not at all lost, perhaps definitely, almost, maybe present. This is a manuscript mobile. This is not a film. This is a film story still being written. And when she begins to read a story, the kind of story in which things happen, in which there are events, they read the beginning of the story as if it were the first thing that had been written and continue along the imagined timeline of its writing. Is this the definition of fiction, that the reader believes in the fictional time of writing? The first lines must take her up in the way that she imagined the idea took up its writer. The first lines must take her up in the way that she imagined the idea took up its writer. They continue reading because it feels to her that the writer felt it worth writing. The story, even if it is not, is experienced as sequential, is experienced as a sequential act of writing. If she were carried along, then so must have been the writer. And yet the first lines are also experienced as an introduction. That is, the writer is introducing them to that which the writer already knows. Is she reading both in the present and the past, a parallel of fictional, the experienced as present, and actual, the experienced as past? Are they believing in both these times of writing, reading as doubling and difference? This is also, of course, the way she has been told to read a screenplay, reading it to see the film, even as she knows that this is not the way in which the film will be made. They believe that the film is there in the form she read it, even though they know, if materialized, it is not. This is a story, a story plural about remembering, a story about memory image, and a story about memory image questioned. It is not necessarily their story, if only I could remember, though their writing of it is. It is the kind of story in which things happen, in which there are events. And here you see that I am introducing you, but this introduction or beginning is not the first thing written. This beginning is a pause, one of many, from somewhere within the tired body of the story, this story by which she is exhausted. The story that at this point they do not think is worth pursuing. When, when I begin to write and read the story, it seemed to speak to me. Now it has gone silent. She is tired of this story of avoidable events in which no one, almost no one, gets to speak. The miscommunication. There is a difference between a drama and its telling. An event in language is to take a step and then another. I have no mise-en-scene without this doubling. I am invisible and I am audience. So the book is written kind of um, in fragments and sometimes there are jumps between uh, the narrative to a completely different narrative or back to the film or back to a consideration of filmmaking. So I've tried to select sections that kind of carry through, um, but that might not always be possible. On speaking, did I buy a text I could not read because I did not think it should be able to be read? I was told this sentence was clumsy, difficult to follow, to speak. Not, I think, a bad thing. What shall I say to them, my critic? Shall I offer instructions, say, try this if you must? 
speak it slowly speak it as if you walked it out step by step did i buy a text i could not read because i did not think it should be able to be read because reading is like writing an act of care performed Tips of tongues. I can't speak French, if I ever could, or hardly, not anymore. I read it a little better than I speak it. My eye is a hole that receives language, but my tongue can't spit it back out. Or rather, it is the wiping of words that happens each time I take them in. When does it happen, this erasure? Is it each night when I sleep? Sometimes it seems it is hourly and I do not notice. How do I know anything at all? An ex, she said to me when we were still together, how do you know so much when you never read anything? It's true that at that time there were long periods in which I didn't read, couldn't. Sometimes I lost the ability once for a whole year. Have I told you this already? A corrosive anxiety made the journey from the beginning of a sentence to its end a kind of torture the words vibrating at frequencies such that their silence was shrill. At other times, and this still occurs, the thoughts on the page triggering the tangents that manifest as an excess of annotations, scrawled notes, so that when I return to the text, I have to start again. I am often afraid of opening a book. Now I find I cannot learn this language that I might have known. Each day I try, and by the next, the new words and structures have dissolved. Each night I am eroded. I wonder if it is the drugs that I have taken, willingly, grudgingly, or unwillingly, psychotropic, antipsychotic. I wonder about the treatments. I wonder about the landscapes and ecologies of my brain. Tips of tongues or edges of eyes, behind the eyes, a blink in language, a space in speaking that is filled with what, what was it you were going to say. Tips of tongues, dry, the rasping buds unbudding, the skin in the mouth feels huge, the tip of the tongue, an unrung bell that tops the swell of muscle, the cut of dead words meet. Tips of tongues, wet, mouth closed so that the excess does not spill. Learn to swallow. Is it words or silence that is stomached? The main is a memory, a significant sea, long lasting and is. Some people would ask for it again. Others are violated and would do anything to avoid this wave of silence. A treatment that involves sending so that your muscles twitch and your body does not convulse, have sphere, have not responded, have asked, have not, are experiencing a long time, are catatonic or repeating for no obvious reason or extremely restless. No one is sure, but no one is known to change the patterns of the brain and also change the energy that is thought. How quickly it is happening. not poetry. They said to her recently, asked her at any rate about not poetry. How can she put this? Sometimes she is called a poet and she says, no, she is not a poet. She merely moves through the spaces and times of writing. She has learned her lesson, which is that categorization can be used against her. They said to her, but you seem to rely she had read something aloud that was nameless. You seem to rely, they said, on all the tropes of poetry. Like what? You know, they said, like rhythm. She can never spell it, never spell it right. Rhythm, rhythm, that's it. And repetition, meter, metaphor. But maybe poetry does not have a monopoly on such things, she said. Perhaps she might have said, I don't like being diagnosed.
a sidestep of photographs. And this is my translation of Camille Laurent's because it's not available in English. So for anyone who knows it, uh, apologies. <laughs> um, Camille Laurent writes of herself that one evening, Chaban de la Foule, and I won't read the rest. I try to translate and imagine that I'm reading that she bathes in the crowd like photographic paper undulating in solution. Her image emerges at the speed of light. Her body in an instant is a snapshot. She aborts the gaze. I am old now, and when I was young, no one I knew owned a camera. And so we captured our fleeting imaginaries of night in mirrors before the night began, filed them behind our eyes. Laurence closes with the assertion that she will resist the lens, resist stillness. She's saying, I think, my translation, that everyone is there and she dances at their center. Their eyes follow her, but cannot bring her to rest. She will not be fixed, will not be known, will not be caught in the freeze frame of their image. You begin to understand and coming nearer, your eyes accompany the movement of a subject influx, unconstrained by a frame, blurred at the edges, mobile, indistinct. These are the states. Laurence's states, in which I can imagine being beautiful, elusive, not quite seen, only ever in the periphery of a lover's gaze. In their embrace, I would feel like weather, uncertain phenomena, mercurial in their hands. Are we okay for time? Marking, I am behind. There's two ex students in the room, so apologies. It's not you I'm referring to. Marking, I am behind a mountain. I am ill. I have my translation to finish, but I also have my work to do. I must have money, but I am too mad to earn it and I cannot take time off. A zero hour contract that stretches to infinite hours. Okay, no holiday, just desperate grubbing, appeasement. Time loses meaning, except for the message that it is running, galloping away. The student writes of Angre, of women, of dresses, of fabric, something about how his love of women's beauty inspires him to use seamless brushwork to depict the flowing fabric of their dresses. And my heart sinks with a where to begin when faced with such a statement. They were writing about his portrait, La Princesse de Broglie, 1853, which depicts a woman, a woman in an ornate cerulean blue satin dress leaning against the back of a gold brocade chair. I stare at the illustration and for a moment mistake the chair for the back of a man dressed in a gold brocade bucket, jacket, his head hidden high up underneath her skirts. And now I struggle to unsee this reading. Mm -hmm. There is some evidence that Angre made use of an optical tool, a lens, to trace the lines of the fabrics from a projection, a more likely explanation than the inspiration of his love of women's beauty. All Angre's paintings of women are like this, material surfaces electric with movement and light, but flesh, ultra white, as befits such art's imperial significations, are still as stone. The woman's face and body, in contrast to the structured liveliness of her skirts, is boneless, dislocated, dead. I wonder why the student is not more curious about the act of making in relation to the act of looking, about what is seen. This is a section where the uh, author is considering, as they translate the film, they start to think about, maybe I can remake, maybe I can re make this screenplay, kind of reimagine what the film might be. Flesh, colored. I think about the food on the table, what it would be, what it would look like, how the camera might linger or not, what the food would silently say, a fish, unfilleted, soul, a sideways glance with milked over eyes, 
petrolatum smeared on an optical flat, a bisque of lobster lit and shot through an orange gel that stands in the path of the beam, a pool of amber in a porcelain bowl, the punctum of concentric rings of light, or consomme, sparkling clear, the light a silver meniscus scattering at the silver of a spoon. I look up the costs of gels and diachroic filters, expensive, with limited life, the colour fading and melting depending on the saturation, the absorption of the energy, the strength of the light it can endure. I scan the colour charts, extensive, pick two, glacier black and bastard amber. That, that is really uh, one of the colours of film gels that you can get. Say it again, bastard amber. <laughs> and then one more time, bastard amber. I can't afford them. I read that early films were sometimes tinted to indicate a mood or time of day. For scenes of fire, fury and explosion, an orange-red tint of copper for anisite, lavender and rose for dawn and dusk and romance, blue for night, for moonlight, what would be the colour of silence? I read that in Renaissance theatre, red wine in a glass container was sometimes used to filter light. What would this light be? a darkly crimson bloodbath. I imagine a scenario in which the glasses of wine were both before the light and in the lens, the hands that raised them fluidly configuring a mobius of cause and effect. I write in my notebook that J. Searle Dawley's Frankenstein 1910 is tinted in the scenes in which the monster is created, an intense orange red, as if flesh precipitates out of flame to settle on his bones. It is not this, though, that makes him meet. That is, that is performed by the refusal of the doctor to be his father, the refusal to give him a name. I don't know why I worry about the filming of the meat. On screen, food largely remains uneaten. So I'm just going to read two more sections. And the another kind of rosy section. And then I'm going to close with the last sequence of the translation that also has my kind of interjections within it. An appointment. They have written barely anything all year. She wakes up anxious, loses the ability to read more than a sentence at once, compulsively buys the book she, think it's, she thinks she ought to read, an atelier by Babel, tottering, Considers buying Valium over the internet if she could have just one week of rest. She spends each morning crying, asking of the other again and again, are you angry with me? Saying each day, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I've ruined your life. The shame of hopeless is a burn. Despair is a dirty word. A lover had told her an anecdote of Virginia Woolf who in psychosis would hear the bird as singing in ancient Greek, and that when they started up this language for the last time, shortly before Wolf filled her pockets with stone and walked out into the river's deeps, Wolf said, not again. She, didn't, she doesn't know if this is true. She hopes it isn't. She hopes it is. She thinks of her lover's lack of, she thinks of her lover's mother who had walked, disappeared alone to the sea. She thinks of her lover's, sorry. She thinks of her lover's mother who had walked, disappeared alone into the sea. She thinks of her lover's lack of tears, how, in, how instead she became convinced she had a tumor because she could feel a lump in her throat. She thinks of Stevie Smith's poem, The River God, and I like people to bathe in me, especially women, and they take their time drowning. Oh, who would guess what a beautiful white face lies there, waiting for me to smooth and wash away the tears. Okay, I've gone on for far too long. Here is the kind of last section. So in the screenplay, it's a story of a man who has a wife and a mistress, 
and he shoots his wife because she thinks that he thinks that she's being unfaithful and then he realizes that his actually she hasn't been unfaithful it's just his mistress has tricked him into being um unfaithful her him into believing she's been unfaithful um and then he shoots himself out of remorse so it's a very it's a very prosaic story actually Susie is the mistress and she's going up to the apartment to find his dead body. Cut to Susie in the elevator, in shadow, dark wood. That's my interjection. Cut to Pierre, his face convulsed with anger, his hand trembling as he points the gun. Pewters, iron, beaten metals. On the screen, a ghosted image, Aimé smiling and reaching out, her arms, projections. Pierre lowers the, lowers the revolver, then raises it again to the door. Then his expression changes from anger to a smile and his hand moves as if he is putting the gun into the left inside pocket of his evening jacket. Dark weave. Cut to Susie on the landing. She goes to ring the door of Pierre's apartment, but then sees that the door is slightly open. She pushes it, brass light, and stands in the doorway looking into the room. Silhouette. Pierre sits perfectly still in his armchair, his right hand concealed in the left hand side of his jacket and pours on this shot. Let the stillness build. Susie gives an affectionate laugh, but then notices how very still he is and still. Susie's face apprehensive, hesitant. She goes to Pierre, eyes, coat, a jacquard mirror and puts her hand on his shoulder and gently shakes him. His hand, holding the gun, falls from his jacket. Rings, like bounces off the stones, and the gun falls to the floor. Susie opens Pierre's jacket and sees the spreading blood stain over his heart. Terrified, she makes to escape. I write in my notebook that I think of that scene in Tess the D'Urbervilles like Deluxe Hardy's women were at best ciphers, in which when Tess had stabbed Angel Claire through the heart, as he lies in his bed, in the blood, lies in his bed, the blood from his wound, mortal, seeped through the mattress, through the bed frame, through the floor, through the cavity to stain the ceiling of the room below, to form the shape of a heart, signifying not her tragedy, but his. She writes, that though she may have remembered the details wrong, her recall of the essence of the ludicrous and cruel melodrama is true, is accurate, is dead on. For Hardy, like Deluc, it is always the vain who gets to be the victim. But then, looks back, reeling with horror. I wonder which end of this sight line I would focus my lens. Her white face whitened, white lights whitening the screen, whites of eyes, mineral apertures widening to crimson, vermilion, cinnabar, carmen, madder rose, madder deep, darkening to caput mortem, because all films in the end are in colour, red, reflective. Pierre's body, motionless in the chair, still smiling. And this time we can choose not to speak. Fin, swim so far out, choose distance, end. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel, and thank you so much, uh, Emma. I'm just thinking if you've got uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask if you guys have got any questions informal to the writers about the work, around the work, outside the work. I've got a question and I was thinking all the way through, how can I just ask one question that will direct uh, uh, at both of you? And I'm thinking of Emma's amazing phrase that I don't like being diagnosed. Thank you very much. I love that. And I think it kind of what some both of you are. Uh, when it comes to I don't like being categorized, I don't like being diagnosed. Rachel, I know that you've got the uh, neuroscience PhD, uh, uh, but instead of like when I read your bio, instead of giving me a 
kind of conventional, okay, I'm a prose writer after having done all the scientific stuff. Actually, it's a wide range of interactive installation, art, film. Even the creative work is a, is a collage of creative nonfiction, theoretical stuff, lots of allusions, references, Boyer, etc. And Emma, your work uh, even more clearly is a, is a, sorry to say, I like that, mismatch of, of you actually in the biography uh, uh, pointed out intergenre, interdisciplinary experimentations, but even the translation itself, I thought, don't take it the wrong way, you're taking this sort of kind of meta translation or translation within translation within translation but actually you take it further a bad translator within a bad translator <laughs> within a bad translator i really love the idea but also again a real uh, kind of montage of um obviously the fine art is 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 the major thing but then but but when it comes to the writing so what is this aversion towards these days and you're not, of course, the only two I know. Uh, 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 this aversion to genre and categorization, and uh, in, and instead this allowing, this taking the liberty to cross these, to breach these sort of conventional borders. <clears throat> I love what you said about the manuscript as mobile. Uh, I think it's a, for me, it's a survival thing. It's about fighting against being fixed. I don't want to be pinned down. I don't want to be held. And I want the things that I choose to uh, give in the end to work with and against each other. I'm very interested in things, elements of the narrative sculpting other elements of the narrative. So they are mobile as well you know they're active they're doing something they're not just um cosmetic uh so yeah but, you know, um i don't know if it's because i've not come from a uh, although lots of people who do write this like this obviously you know do come from literature backgrounds but i didn't come from a literature background so um, the idea of it being a, doing a particular thing when it comes to language was not ever anything I had to think about. And I suppose my uh, writing practice actually merged out of kind of the tradition of art practice, mm -hmm. particularly the um, like the lineage of, of modernism and art, mm -hmm. uh, the, li the lin lineage of the relationship between mm -hmm. the kind of modernist literature and um, artists practices really. mm -hmm. um it's also slightly fear i remember like you know uh, um when i first started meeting poets and there seemed to be an awful lot of baggage to being a poet and i had you know i've not read words words i've not read keats i can't you know and i'd be sitting there saying stuff and they'd go yeah what have you seen and i'm thinking no i fucking haven't <laughs> sorry you know um so it's partly actually fear about, um, I think it is, uh, confidence about, I don't want to, I'm not going to mistake a claim on a particular kind of writing. And obviously I'm not now as incompetent, as unconfident as I used to be. But there is something like about uh, who, territory, who owns territories, and how mm -hmm, as, mm -hmm. uh, you have to kind of step your, and I think it's practice, where earn your stripes. Earn your stripes, and you have to be seen to earn your stripes. And, and what belongs to who, and I think, depending on where you, what your background is, and I think particularly for women writers, perhaps, and and many writers of colour, there's that, you know, uh, taking, it's a it's a it's a tricky territory of trying to take ownership. Um, but also, I saw a talk by uh, E.K. Reader, Elizabeth Reader, yeah. actually. At, um, yeah. Anyway, it'll come to me. Um, you were there in yes, the room. Uh, oh, and not uh, just, just the other uh, one. UEO. The one at UEO. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and she's, but she had this phrase, genreification. Uh, you know, like John. Is it Julia Bell? 
No. Oh, I think it was, it was Elizabeth Reed. Maybe it wasn't her no. phrase, but she talked about genreification. And it, it, like you would gentrify a neighborhood, you can genreify something. And she also related it to um, marketing, actually. You know, when what what's your publisher put on the book at the back? Does it, is it filed under poetry? Mm. Is it filed under, you know, where does it go in Waterstone? That's kind of thing mm. we need to know. Yeah. Uh, so the, the links to kind of market and capital as well, I think, are quite interesting. Mm. Um, I mean, I've always said, uh, you know, I could never write a novel. I always said I would never write long form unless it's out. It's long. Uh, I said I would never write a novel. I couldn't, couldn't imagine that kind of the land, ma having to map that landscape. And then I read, um, I think, one of the first novels that kind of as a writer engaged me that I read was um, Driving, Driving Plow of the Friends of the Dead. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it made sense to me about, not as a reader, but as a writer, how one might construct that kind of territory. Mm -hmm. Just to follow up, you don't need to reflect on it, but I mean, Rachel's biography doesn't even include terminology such as novelist. Uh, artists, not even the artists, it's just, just purely the work itself is there. But you are very humble as well. It's like you mentioned the artist and you mentioned the prose, but leaving it rather vague. Anyway, really interesting. I think uh, that also at this time of my life, I feel there's a kind of a, uh, you know, with, with everything that goes on in a woman's brain and body at this time, I feel like it's a bit of a gloves off time, you know, mm -hmm. and that means that. Um, uh, 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 so that goes both ways. So one thing is that I don't want people to think that any kind of clarity or, or well-delineated genre uh, is what my life is like because uh, I don't. Clarity can very easily uh, betray my confusion, and my writing is about my confusion as, uh, as much mm -hmm. as anything else. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not ashamed to be mental. <laughs> That's that. Brilliant. Thank Solidarity you. Solidarity with that. Uh, me too. <laughs> me too. Uh, anyone else? Go on. Um, this is just a point. Um, I noticed that in the other introduction, I mentioned the point from nothing to never. And text is central to the text in us rather than motion of the text. So both texts appear to me to be essentially arranged around the central absence. Um, and I wondered if you'd like to uh, expand on that idea a little bit for us. Yeah. Um... I, uh, yeah, I think um, knowledge is not very good uh, at, at helping us get to those absences that draw us in, uh, uh, you know, uh, like a vacuum full of air in, it's something like that, it's something that uh, makes me want to but it pulls me there, and then I have to stay there. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, yeah, uh, I've written quite a bit recently on, on what it is, the, the kind of like still point of, of creativity and, and how the work and you are in a relationship, a dynamic relationship, uh, and when you know, you let go of each other's throats for just a second, that's when things can happen. So, uh, um, yeah, I've got almost too much to say on stillness, really, or, or absence, definitely. Uh, in fact, in the front of this book, there's a quote by um, Anne Carson, which is, uh, a space must be maintained or desire ends. And it's it's that pull of the absence is something that I think anyone who writes or makes anything has, has got to know intimately. Mm -hmm. 
I think um, just thinking about Anne Carter and her fantastic essay uh, called The Right to Remain Silent, and there's a section where she's talking about um, uh, the uh, trial of Joan of the transcripts of the trial of Joan of Arc mm -hmm. and Joan's kind of refusals that, like, they'll, so they'll say, you know, they'll ask her a question and she'll say, Ask me next Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, or they'll say, um, There's one great um, line. Well, what what language do you does your what language does God speak to you in? And she just goes a better language than yours. Mm -hmm. And it's like that. Um, so there's absolutely there's it. That radio full program. <laughs> it's just like this fantastic. Um, it is a weaponization of uh, an absence of answer mm -hmm. or refusal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I yeah. think. For, I mean, for this book in particular. Um, I was really, what really made me go and buy the Duluth or find, track down the Duluth screenplay mm -hmm. was the fact that when I'd been reading about it, I thought I was reading about it, about the film, and that the uh, the person who's, who's more in Turin who's very good on uh, her book, um, Flash Back in Memory in early film, and um, she kept referring to the film. It is a film that it is a film that is blah blah blah, and I but I and I kept kind of going back and said but and then you know there's a one line where it says the film is lost so well, we have the screenplay and I'm like but you're writing about the film and I'm quite interested in screenwriting uh, and my interest in screenplays as artifacts in themselves because they are not the film and a, a traduction a tour like you can buy. Um, <coughs> Like you can buy the screenplay to uh, Who Washington Mon Mon and Moore and Last Year at Marion Bad in lovely editions, but they're not what the, they're not what the film they're not what would be worked with. They're literally a kind of back translation written as a screenplay. So I'm really interested in like the the and uh, <laughs> Claudia Sternberg calls the screenplay literature in flux. So the absent whenever you think about a screenplay that has been produced, there is this absence. But also equally, the, 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 but also the equally, you have filmmakers who consider the screenplay redundant once the film is like Tark Tarkovsky says once the film has been made, the screenplay burns. You know, like, kind of metaphorically, but that idea of these two, I like the idea of the two artifacts that kind of are fighting all the time to erase the other. Mm -hmm. um, Which is and, exactly what. Helen was talking about his relationship. You mean me? I'm Rachel. Rachel, no, I do apologize. It's all right. It's all right. Um, Rachel was talking about her relationship, absence in her text. Mm. And, uh, I hesitate to call it writing, but it's a very complicated word. Yeah. Um, so I've, become, I've become really interested recently in bricolage. I don't know how to define it, you probably do. But it, it, it's just the idea that whatever is is you're trying to create has an effect on the form that you're using to create it, and vice versa, and that that makes things mobile mm. uh, and and kind of yeah. I'm really interested in the difference between collage and bricolage. I think I thought, okay with my art hat on, then teaching art hat on, uh, and I, I'm. This is a very simplistic thing, but you know we can understand collage as a kind of pasting of flatness. But bricolage is always there's that intrusive materiality mm -hmm. that is going to push. So brick, when you're talking about bricolage artworks like rock or something, there's always some. So there'll be like a yeah a tea tray stuck on the canvas, yeah, and there's that. Box, yeah, so it's like that. Just the materials are kind of not behaving, and they don't behave themselves. No, I like to. <laughs> so I like to think. I think what I like to fantasize about is bricolage as collage when I'm yeah. writing. So yeah. I can't, you know, I can't. What I have to do to make those three D artifacts exist uh, is mess around in ways that just traditional genre would not let me yeah. do. Mm. Beautiful. Anyone else? Adam. Yeah, I was just wondering about the effect of all of the absence of the kind of burning and screenplay, whether 
though at the same time the, the image, whatever one has of it, is nothing at all but one block absence. Or, or that like um, demands language uh, in, in those who see that even if it's a kind of sign of artwork or a sign of beauty, but those images demand language of some kind in the receiving it. <laughs> red, red demands the word color red. Or, mm. or, you know, so that's maybe too simplistic, but it's whether there is a kind of call and response, which is. I think def <laughs> we go and see a film and then we think about it. You know, yeah. uh, and so it, it, it always has this kind of life, and we think about it. You know, you, you, obviously one thinks in images, but one also, you know, thinks in. I think one thinks when one's imagine, reimagining or remembering moving image or any kind of image, you're you're thinking in a way that um, it, it's image thought but language thought, and the two are kind of entwined. Um, it's and regarding, I mean, I'm so interested in early film and its relation to language, or or supposedly not. And I think it's Andre Gaudrillard who he kind of reminds us that. Uh, Silent film was never silent. So very early for people, you know, the very early days of film, we didn't have no, they didn't have the visual grammar. You know, we sit and watch things and there's cuts and there's lower la -la flashback, and it all, you know, it makes sense because we have that. It, watching is our language, but they didn't have that, so they would literally have sometimes front of screen narrators or uh, phonographic records behind screen actors, full orchestras, whatever. The early film, you know, silent film was never silent. And sometimes it was a very noisy, it was a very noisy, cluttered kind of thing. Um, and I had something very clever to say then, and I can't remember it. <laughs> I can't remember it. Sort, but of, it, sort of interdisciplinary with the yeah, orchestra yeah, and the yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. Yeah. I love this idea. Yeah. 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 Also, Stephen Price is really interesting on screenplay. He talks about what's not on the page. You know, so the conversations, the people going like the conversations when people are going like this, crossing stuff out, all that stuff is part of the screenplay, mm -hmm. but it's not, yeah. it's not part of the printed. Yeah. yeah. So there's this whole discourse all the time going around, and um, it's it's very sad when something's actually published in a way, isn't it? Mm. It's just very, yeah, it's you bastards. Yeah. Big uh, something like this Johnson kind of solution is not really a solution to that. Yeah. Okay. Shall we draw a line here and say a huge thank you to Emma and Kate Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to you all who uh, came today. And just to say that the next reading is going to be the 24th of October, um, an online one with Maggie Nelson. Uh, with some questions uh, towards the end, and we really invited lots of undergraduates as well. So um, do spread the word because uh, there is lots of space on Zoom, uh, mm -hmm. lots of bum seats. <laughs> um, do you want to say something, Maria? Well, I need to say I've got the flyers here, which due to my incredible sorry, I can't speak about angles, but they will happen. <laughs> Due to my terrible lateness, which I apologise to everybody. And you weren't late at all, we've well, just started. I couldn't park on them, I couldn't pay park on them, I couldn't get in the building. But otherwise, <laughs> I was really successful. Just get but, to the um, point. There's two very good things this week. There's Tom Jenks, who people probably know, who is absolutely brilliant, funny, dead pan, <laughs> non generically classifiable in many ways, <laughs> writer. Next uh, Wednesday, the Performance Lab at uh, Sheffield Palum, and next Tuesday, I'm launching a book um called spillways which i wrote with someone called kim martindale which is it is next tuesday next tuesday it's yeah not look you see i've done something really clever here in order to, as an environmental person i have to save paper you know so and a, a two-part thing that tells you about that so if i can give the people as they go i was going to lay them out discreetly but instead i'm doing do this. you want to say a little self-promotion to say a little bit yeah. about your book launch? my god this is great <laughs> 
<laughs> now I feel like we all have to go. <laughs> yes, you all have to go to my book launch next Tuesday, and then you have to go and see Tom Jex next Wednesday. They're both at the Performers Lab at six thirty. They're um, yeah. shared events with off the shelf, which means that you can go and book on Eventbrite. I mean, they like it if you go and book on Eventbrite, but you don't. If you don't get around to doing that, just come because <laughs> actually it's not it's essential. Uh, one of the... They're free. Yeah. Yes, the Performance Lab is Arundel um, Gate. So do you know where everyone know where the Millennium Gallery is? Yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. up the road a bit, across the road from there. Anyway, I'll give you all one of these. Um, but no, but I, you still don't haven't said anything about the book itself. That's what which I, one? My book. The one you have launched. Oh, okay, the book I'm launching. <laughs> it's a sort of um, open form, collaborative, shared text around the hydrospheres of Yorkshire. That was part of it. Was written as part of an AHRC network grant, although it has absolutely. It wasn't meant to be done at all. It's one of those things that happened because of COVID, because we couldn't do the network. So we did that instead. We went to walk around the reservoirs. We did lots of walking through the seasons and wrote this sort of long poem. So we'll be reading from it, but also talking about art and flood and people, how people feel about water mm -hmm. and scarcity and flood. Oh, I have to be there. You have to be there. Lots of water. Yeah, that's <laughs> I will, in fact, largely be speaking as water. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Really Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.